Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wired Nerdy Podcast. My name is Keith. This is Doug. Episode number 22 of season two. Doug, how you doing, man? You awake? You awake this morning? Yeah, I'm doing good. Are we going to have a good show? Fresh pot of coffee. I think we got some really good articles. There's been some really interesting stuff in the news, and I'm excited to get into it. It's been nutty. We will get into that for our main stuff, as if it hasn't been beaten to death. But we're going to give it the old wired nerdy angle is what we'll do here, which is always a very interesting perspective um, on that. And so I, I do want to call out something. I notice you do not have a boom mic. What is going on? For those not on video, yeah. Doug normally has a big old boom mic right in front of his face. So I uh, should have gotten a new boom mic on the Amazon Prime sale. I just kind of forgot. You snoozed. Out. But I'm rocking the original, if people on video can see. Yeah. It's like a minimalist mic. stand there. Yeah. It's very nice because uh, first world problems, I couldn't see my keyboard the way I had my boom mic set up. Now I can see my keyboard. I can do my little background research. It's going to be great. So you know what's and awesome? I think uh, you can still hear me really well, good. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know what's awesome? Your audio is coming in very, very clear. I mean, yeah. dare say, I, if I didn't know, I didn't see the boom, I wouldn't know that you didn't have it. And you don't have it like right in front of you, but it sounds really good. Maybe because it's tilted up or something. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and you got to see this half lovely face, half not lovely <laughs> face, you know? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Look at Doug making the podcast more beautiful. <laughs> okay. All right. You ready to queue up the nerd news? We have some weird stuff, man. <laughs> we do. I'm excited. Let's get to it. All right. Let's do it. Let's queue up the nerd news. Nerd news. All right. Let me get the screen share going here. Uh, Got to open up the right thing. There we go. Get us in order. You know, I was really surprised. Um, we always say this. Like, you just never know what some weeks will bring some weeks. There's like awesome stuff. And when I first started looking, I was like, ah, there's not much, but then we got to dig in. We're like, actually it was pretty eventful. So. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to talk about, and I swear, you know, with the development of AI and now they make pictures, I thought this is clearly got to be an AI rendered photo, but it's not. It so looks so stupid. Xbox <laughs> is making a Deadpool Xbox controller. And you're like, okay, it'll be red. It'll have the little straps and stuff. No, no. This has butt cheeks on the back of it. And in full Deadpool leather textured pant butt cheeks. Honestly, on the back of it. it is a really cool looking controller. Like, I love the texture yeah. of it. I love that it's red. It is an awesome controller. The butt cheeks just ruin it for me because. The- <laughs> Like we got the video playing. It's so dumb. Like that would be so uncomfortable when you're playing. Oh, this absolutely. is a novelty collectible thing. This is not a functional You know, controller. for those so I've got my Xbox controller here and it's, it's super flat. very flat on the back. You know, I have really good grip. I think two butt cheeks, if you look at my hands, they'll be out here. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be annoying. It'd be annoying. I think a lot of this was because during the marketing between Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds, he was always making comments about Hugh Jackman's butt in the yellow Wolverine suit. That's probably where some of this goes to. Now, I appreciate the humor and the marketing and the cross-marketing ploy, but it's not functional. No. <laughs> it's so dumb. <laughs> but it makes me laugh, so, uh, you know, who knows. I wonder if it'll be, like, highly collectible. Oh, I'm sure. Just what? like uh, <laughs> these popcorn buckets. Oh, you're going to jump to that? You gonna? Oh, you want to jump skipping. to that? That's a good segue. All right. Well, you know what? You're right. We're gonna jump to it. So let me go ahead and jump over. Let me drag this bad boy over here. Just so so this forget. summer, there <laughs> or this year, I think. I don't think it was last year. There has been a trend in what I would call weird and collectible popcorn buckets. Yeah. So the latest addition to that is a big a xenomorph head. For those who don't know, a xenomorph is the uh, alien in the franchise Aliens and. Alien and Aliens Revolution and on and on and on. Yeah, you can't tell. We got a picture of it. So it's an alien head, but they put a flap at the top. Now, I will say this. It's a long, it's a very long, elongated head. You could probably put a lot of popcorn in that. Um, you know, they missed yeah. an opportunity here. They should have had the mouth open and the little other I, mouth bring you some popcorn. I think they learned their lesson that sticking your hands in mouths after the dune bucket. Uh, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> you got a point. Because if you remember the the Wolverine Deadpool one, it's also their heads with their their mouths. It <laughs> and you does gotta look st- a little obscure, yeah. So bad. Yeah, this popcorn bucket thing's getting out of control. Um, yeah, man, I saw that and I was like, oh wow, that's that was a choice. 
I mean, it looks really cool. As far as collectibles, you know, I have stuff in my background on uh, the video here. Lots of collectibles. That would look really cool in the background. Yeah, and we got a video of somebody like actually holding it, turning it around. But they show them filling it with. I will say, it wonder would, how much popcorn fits in there. You know, it's not as much as a bucket, but that's actually pretty big. That's a decent size. That's a huge, yeah. So you actually may not be too bad, you know? I don't know. I can see somebody getting it, like you, like it has a room like yours, and then absolutely um, putting it in the background, putting it on a shelf. You know, yeah. the holding it, I think, would be weird. I mean, I wonder if it sits in your lap a certain way. It's so it weird. Just, it would take up your entire lap. <laughs> you know what? Though this speaks to how theaters are going to they're reaching to get the audiences back, and it is yeah. unique. I will say that. So. You know, kind of a heartfelt message. I don't want to see theaters go away. And this probably is, like you said, a marketing scheme. Not Maybe not a scheme, but a plan to, hey, come. We're going to give you more than just a movie ticket and a show. We're going to give you some memorability to take home with you. Yeah. And we talked, I think, one of the episodes. Like one of the things that they're trying to do to get people back into theaters, there was the Kevin Costner Western. It's called Horizon. And it was, I love the concept of it in, in that. They were releasing part one one month and then part two the next month, almost like how Netflix has series. They were going to do that, but with theatrical release back to back. I think it's a great idea. However, unfortunately, I haven't seen it myself, but the reviews, it's terrible. It's so bad. It's so bad that they canceled the part two release in August. It came out in July, canceled in August, and they said they're going to go straight to demand streaming video for part one to build an audience, and maybe at some point they'll release part two. Yeah. So I, I was kind of I'm bummed in a way because I was hoping this model would take off because think about it. They, they filmed Matrixes, Lord of the Rings, and oh, give me another one. Um, like Our, the, big, the big series that they did back oh, to back. Okay. Yeah. They did back to back. I think it would be cool if they would have released them closer if they could have. Granted, maybe they wouldn't make as much money. I think they would. But anyway, I was hoping it would work. It didn't. And Kevin Costner put like two two million dollars of his own money into it. Yeah, and so. the thing that's upsetting is uh, Kevin Costner was on a amazing show called Yellowstone. Yep. So I think there were some money issues with Yellowstone. Then he went to make this movie, which is bombing. Yeah. You know, I don't feel bad for the guy, but I feel bad for the fans of Yellowstone. Yeah. And I like Westerns. We don't see them very often. So anyway, no, I didn't mean to take us down a rabbit hole, but just speaking no, of movie no, theaters yeah. doing stuff. All right. It wouldn't be a Wired Nerdy News segment without this. AI. Yeah. Let's, let's do this. OpenAI is releasing a cheaper, smarter model. Uh, the new model is called ChatGPT for. Oh, mini and it launches today um so what's different about this is that it says that it's uh it's for developers and tinkerers uh for basically chat gpt it costs significantly less than full-size models and is said to be more capable than 3.5 it's interesting how they're doing this now i don't think this can do all like the image rendering i don't believe so reading the article it's going to do some basic stuff for you. you this is going to help your small-time developers and mm -hmm. people. And it can do uh, text summarization. So if you drop like a whole PDF document that's like a whole novel in, uh, it, it can do summaries. And it can do stuff like that. It can do comparative analysis very quickly. And I think the biggest benefit, they said, is that it's really fast because it doesn't have all of this stuff so it does i don't know it's it's more agile so this would be good because if you're just wanting to attach if you're a developer you're making a software and you're just wanting to attach the logic and reasoning part and you need it to respond quickly this is where this would come into play so it's kind of interesting uh, if you want to integrate ai i think that's what they're doing they're making integration of ai into your software uh, way easier that's that's the concept behind this so this whole ai thing is going to continue to unfold and it's just nuts. It's like a like a weird race. So we'll see. Yeah, you see, and I'm sure you've seen in your career uh, what I call bumps or uh, <laughs> fast uh, upgrades. No, they're bumps. What that's I'm for trying sure. to explain is you have your line of technology, and then every all of a sudden, boom, 
somebody develops some game changing yep. thing and then it starts over with the flat line yep. on that technology. I'm trying to explain it. That no, way. you're doing perfectly. The, the dot com boom, the, well, just the internet in general, but, but, but the thing is these, these bursts were either in short burst or long periods of time between them. Yep. You know, you got internet dot com burst. You have iPhone smartphones. You have, let's see, Amazon, you have Google, like with these little infinite little bursts of things that which Google, of course, was the way that we search. iPhone was having the Internet in your pocket and all this information shopping online. And I do remember a lot of people being critical. Oh, that's never going to catch on. Da, 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 da. You know, I'm never going to shop online. That's not safe. You know, it's just so funny how these little bursts happens. I think what's odd about this we obviously had a burst around last year when GPT came out, especially with four. But now it's exponentially the, the time between burst is becoming more frequent. It's getting faster and faster and faster. And I think that's what worries people is because if we don't understand it in its current state and it's accelerating at, you know, at a certain rate, will it, could it get out of control? And we have Skynet. You never know, right? Hopefully so. not. Hopefully not. <laughs> All right, on to a brighter subject. Yeah. I know you're excited about this. I want you to talk about it. I'm super excited. So uh, games come and go, um, talking about football games in general. NCAA College Sports Football, I think that's the name of it. So yeah. it stopped. 25. 24, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it stopped in 2014. So our friend, your brother Brian, has a copy or copies of college football Tons and tons of money because they stopped that franchise. It's a rare. So yeah. we actually talked to him a couple of days ago. It is affecting prices of those games with the new release of College Football 25. It's similar to Madden for those who I'm confused myself, but the <laughs> names are weird. So College Football 25, it's an EA sports product. Only the college football teams. You know, you have Madden NFL for the pro teams, but it looks really good. The reviews coming out on it are amazing. People have paid tons of money for the premium version, which doesn't always happen, but a uh, huge success so far. Yeah, a lot of people have been asking for this since uh, college football. And something had happened between the NCAA at the time. I think it's changed now. They keep changing their name. But there was something with the, the college sports infrastructure and the sports game and money transactions of what they what schools were making on it versus what players were making off for likeness. And there was all this legal stuff. That's why it stopped in 2014. And ever since then, people have been wanting college football and they haven't had a game. It's been a drought, so to speak. And this is now the answer to that. So people are excited. And on top of that, it's apparently it's a good game. Um, cause it used to be, in my opinion, I feel like college, the college football games were just kind of like Madden reskinned. That's how I felt. Um, but you know, and you know me, I'm not like a big sports guy, but I do love sports video games as weird as that is. And I haven't, I haven't kept up with Madden, you know, I'll pick it up once in a blue moon, but I haven't kept up with it. But I will tell you, like, this game looks amazing. There were screenshots that I have seen where there is, and maybe this is on Madden, I'm sure it is, but there's like water that beads on their helmets when it rains. Oh, it's crazy, yeah. And there's one, like this photo here of the Colorado, University of Colorado Stadium. If you just glance at that, that looks like a photo. You know, and the last time I played like one of the NBA games, which wasn't the last one, NBA 25 kind of tanked. It was, it was terrible. Uh, but 24 was really good. It blew me away when I'm playing it. It's getting to the point, it's almost so photorealistic that when you walk into a room and if somebody's playing the the game, it looks like a real game on TV. Yes. And so I love that. I love that about my professional wrestling games too. So I don't know. I'm kind of excited about this. The reviews are good. I may even pick this one up at some point uh, just because it, it looks, the graphics look amazing. Uh, I love about, like I told you before, since I'm not a sports guy, I don't keep up with people nowadays. I'm like a 90s sports guy. You know, I know all about like, the 90s NFL and the 90s NBA. I know all those people. I don't know anybody today because I don't keep up with it. I'm a big, yeah. I, I'm too, too steeped into nerd culture. But with this, I don't need to know names. <laughs> so, but I do know universities. So, Yeah, the thing with the college football is there are some fanatics out there. There are fans that only love college football and yeah. they say that the NFL is stupid. Now, there's vice versa. There's people that love NFL and say college football is not worth their time. 
So you're getting these die hard yeah. college football fans playing this game, love this game. So it's going to be very, very successful. I think it's interesting how they, for like Pro Bowls or for what is it, Super Bowls, things like that, they'll run statistics. So let the game, let the computer play the game out and then they see who's going to win. And I think I once saw with Madden and Super Bowls, the AI is getting so good. Like it used to be at like a 50% accuracy but now that's been slowly creeping up as the the player models have gotten better and the ai has gotten better but people will do that and then they'll place bets on it so like they'll run it through madden so many times and see who's going to win and then they'll like that's who they'll bet on <laughs> and so ea had to come out and be like yeah don't do that don't don't bet with our we don't want to be responsible for your money so that's kind of funny now the i don't think there was a curse with the uh, NCAA series, yeah. but there was what's called the Madden curse. It was yeah. if you were on the cover of the new Madden football game, your team may not do well. So yeah, there is there is something about that. So yeah, man, it very, looks very good. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. You know, I'm only on PC. You've got some consoles. Yeah. I uh, hope it comes to PC, but uh, I don't. Know. It will. I, I think it will. Won't it? Does uh, it say in the article? It's nothing yet. So. Is it going to be console release only? That would surprise me. Let's find out. I'm looking. Doesn't say in the article. Yeah, so uh, PC Gamer had an article saying that it's not on there now. They don't know why it's not. But that <laughs> EA hasn't mentioned anything yet. Why oh, that really surprises me. Uh, they will. I know they do the they they always put the the basketball ones almost always, and because I see it in Steam. Yeah. So anyway, all righty. Next, this one is interesting, and I think it's a good thing. In a break from the norm, Bethesda. Now, be let's be clear, Bethesda is a video game studio that's very popular. They made franchises like Skyrim, the most recent Starfield game. Mm-hmm. and fallout doom like They've huge titles great oh, titles yeah. yeah my son who's about to start university and wants to go into game development would love to work at bethesda uh, the real tricky thing is with the game industry not just bethesda but everywhere is that it's feast or famine on work and ai is having an influence on a lot of that so it does worry me a little bit that he's going into an industry that traditionally in the past is not only hard to be able to break into, but on a whim, you work on a project and they just fire you. You're gone. So that's kind of worried me. However, Bethesda Game Studio workers have unionized. Now, this has only happened recently on a large scale before with Blizzard, right before Microsoft bought them. Blizzard makes Diablo, they make World of Warcraft, and many other things. So this unionization, that has never been a thing typically within the video game industry. So this is very, very unique. But they had more than 200 workers have formed a union at the Legendary Studio. I, for one, think this is a good thing. Now, unions are a mixed bag because, as I told you before, there's like unions are great. They protect workers. They they do wonderful things. The downside of unions is sometimes they overreach or they don't represent their population. Over time, sometimes they get lazy and then they're not really out for the employees. They're kind of out for themselves. And they provide coverage for lazy employees. So if you have rock star union workers and then you have crummy union workers, guess what? Union's going to have your back no matter what. So it kind of creates this breeding ground for where you're not incentivized to have you know get rid of the dead weight let's put it that way those are that's just my objectionable opinion of of it i think they're good and bad so i don't have like oh unions are terrible i also don't think they're great either i'm 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 balanced i'm middle of the road i think they're wonderful and they serve an awesome purpose they're good when they're good right but they're bad when they're bad (laughs) so for me this i think this is wonderful news I think it's dramatically needed within the video game industry because I hate to say it, a lot of these companies are just yanking these workers around. And this is what's ridiculous too. You have unions inside of film and movies, right? People don't know this. Video games yield per year more money in capital than the film industry, uh, music industry, and even some sports industry combined. That's how big video the video game industry is. So that much money, and they're treating people so poorly, I think it's BS. I uh, agree with you on everything you said. You know, 
I, I believe you know a little more than me, but these programmers, these developers, they come in, they make this project for this company, and the company could say, okay, our project's done, you're gone. That's exactly so this, what they do. Uh, mm-hmm. gives them a little protection, you know. Yeah. They're working 20-hour days Crazy. maybe sometimes just Easy. to get, meet the project deadline. Yep. And then to be told, hey, sorry, we're done. Next Pack your project. bags. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, dude, you're, you're spot on. I, I think it's only fair for them to have protections. Yes. And and for me, I love video games, man. It's why I got into computers in the first place. And you and I have talked about this. Like, we don't mind if a video game takes longer to make. Because a lot of games do, well, we don't want unions because it'll slow down the development time. And what they're worried about is, well, if we have to, if this, if these people work 60-hour weeks, we need to agree to give them some time off. And it's going to slow down. You know what? That's okay. Because guess what? I believe that if they're well rested and uh, treated well, and yeah, it'll take the game a little longer. It'll probably hit their profits a little bit because of the time. But you know what? The game's going to be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and you and I have talked about that. Like, we're not proponents of just shoving it out the door with bugs. I mean, there's so many games, and there's been a, there's very few studios that have redeemed themselves from that. Cyberpunk did. It was a terrible game at launch, it, just because they rushed it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the staple. No Man's Sky was horrendous upon release, but they have dramatically redeemed themselves. So I don't know, man. But what was it? You know what helped both of those studios? Time. Yeah. They put the time in. So I hope unions will facilitate that and people will keep their jobs and that they can stay on, especially if they're talented. And that's my take. I, I really think this is a good thing. And I hope it catches on. I think it's neat. I almost think that, dare I say it, in IT, as as AI rises, I think there almost needs to be more unionization of IT. So, in some cases, not all. Yeah, and uh, talking about uh, coming out too early, I think the biggest, one of the most recent success stories was the Sonic uh, movie. I know I've talked about this on the podcast before, but talk about releasing it and the customers are like, whoa, this yeah, is this terrible. This doesn't look right. Yeah. And uh, kudos to that company for taking yeah. it back and saying, okay, they hate it. We're not going to do good. We're fixing it. Well, and the and Sonic I, movies have been well received as a result, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're making and like I a third one I think that's the same thing now? with No Man's Sky and with uh, Starfield. Had a couple issues. They're fixing all those, it looks like. They're doing good. Yeah. So. yeah. I think this is a good thing. I think so, too. All right. This next one's a weird one, but it's interesting to me. Dyson, the vacuum cleaner maker, unmasked its super customizable on-track headphones are about 500 bucks. What's interesting about this, you can swap out the plates on the back and all of the ear cups. And they said there's over like 2,000 ways that you can customize it. So I have to put my dad joke in here. Do you think these headphones will suck? (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was wondering hilarious. if they were like an earwax cleaning device, which is kind of <laughs> gross. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. They're going from the vacuuming field to the audio field, which is so saturated already. You know, you look it at is. Sony Boy Bose. I Bose. Always say that wrong. Yeah, that's all right. And uh, well, there's tons of them. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah there's tons like, of them. Yeah, they're, they're Sennheiser. Uh, dude, there's just so many of them. Oh, I mean, yeah. Beats. It's such a saturated market that yeah. you're going to have to make something really, really good to get an edge at all. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And so I do think it's a cool customized. That's a that's a cool angle that we've not seen uh, with these. They look cool, but. I, just, I mean, that uh, is a premium price. So for you to come out as a brand new audio company. At that price point, you know, I've watched a lot of Shark Tank here, but <laughs> yeah. that uh, doesn't seem too good. Well, I think they're competing with the Apple Air Maxes. Those are the over-ear ones. They're also competing with Bose, you're right, over the ear. Sony has a set that's like, there are, at the 500 of the price point, there are quite a few uh, that are, you know, at that point. So I, that, that's the market they're going after. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, Dyson makes good stuff. I will say that. They've, they've gotten into hair dryers. They've gotten into like hair products, curling irons, like curling irons that blow dry while you curl. So they've, they've dipped their toe into other markets just besides the vacuum market. So this kind of doesn't surprise me, but it does. It does have a cool looking case, though. Look at that. It does. Neat. You know, I'm rocking these uh, razors. Oh, dude, they razor makes good stuff. Amazing. 
I love Razor. And I mean, I paid maybe 80 bucks for them, but they yeah. are so nice. Razor makes great stuff. And then I'm rocking, which is crazy because I'm very picky about like how things fit in my ear. For, so on my microphone, it has a, a monitor in it. So I, you can get feedback loop on yourself. These are skull candies, honestly. And I had a pair of bows before these and I love the bows, but they're expensive for just wired headphones and then i found these skull candies and i almost think they're better and they were like 20 bucks <laughs> so nice. yeah and don't get me wrong i love me some good over over the year headphones for a while there a long while i was this close to getting the apple uh air maxes they're the yeah. over there because they're supposed to be really good the only thing is when i did a lot of research and there was a dude in an airport when i was traveling and i asked him i was like do you like them and everybody loves them except they say they squeeze your head oh yeah. and they're really tight not and adjustable think, at all not much no not much they, they are I've a little a bit big melon here so that would work uh, yeah out. yeah and that was my concern too is like well, would it be comfortable because here's my only thing with over the years is that if you wear them for long periods of time, they can get under comfortable. Now, I will say for my PlayStation 5, for when you and me and Joe and Aaron, we get on and we play games, uh, I had just got over Christmas a Steel Series headset. Holy cow. Now, that was about 150 bucks, but I will tell you, they are comfortable. It's like you're not even wearing them, but they sound amazing. Probably the best over the years I've had for, for gaming. So they're, they're up there with the... Uh, those razors, in my opinion, they're very comfortable. Steel series, so they make good stuff. All right, last one. Boom! Paramount Plus cancels the Halo TV show only after two seasons. This doesn't surprise me. It wasn't received great. A lot no. of people are mad that they didn't stick to the IP. But I don't know, man. Like The Last of Us didn't stick to the IP either, but people love it. You know, Fallout did stick to the IP and it's crushing it. It's amazing. Yeah. I told my wife about this. She's like, you don't think they'll cancel fallout. Do you I'm like, no <laughs> fallout's winning so I'm many gonna, awards, uh, get pitchforks and lanterns <laughs> and go down. You would not be the only one. Fallout is just huge right now. So oh, man, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, I don't know. I enjoyed the show. I thought it was good, but you know, being a comic book guy, I'm used to variants, meaning tweaks in stories, you know, uh, one minute Batman is married to Catwoman, the next he is not. You know, it's the same with Superman. One minute he married Lois Lane, one minute he doesn't. You know, so like they have different variants because they try to always keep it fresh. So I'm kind of used to stories being switched up like that. So I have a higher tolerance for story tweaks. And I, I thought he looked great as Master Chief. Um, I didn't lose my mind when he took his helmet off because he doesn't do that in the video game. I don't know. It's just interesting that Paramount decided to do this. And it's just, I think the reception of it is probably what, what did it. And I was looking in the article to see there said the, the showrunners are hopefully will find a new home for the series. Now this would be a good pickup for Netflix or for, you know, you know, another streaming service. So, yeah, you know, you worry about, you said Netflix, they seem to, <laughs> they cancel early <laughs> while they're doing good. <laughs> Which that blows my mind. But uh, yeah, reading the article, uh, a lot of fans were mad they haven't seen the Halo yet of any kind of detail. The uh, reveal of Master Chief's face was also something that really kind of turned their stomach. And then uh, some changes from the game were uh, what the article says. Do you know they're making a Bioshock show? Oh, no. Hopefully that does good. I've played a lot of Bioshock Infinite. I haven't played Bioshock. Uh, is it one and two? You're killing me, Doug. I know. Doug. I know. Doug. Are we going to go through this it, again? I own it. So here, I'm downloading it right now. Did you ever watch but Rocky? I, I did. I watched all the Rockies. Oh, update. So <laughs> we talked about the patriotic <laughs> movies. I watched the entire Rocky series. I'm uh, sorry. Not a fan. <laughs> Yeah, I told you it, it's a, it's an acquired taste. I told you they the all weren't good. One. You said the fifth one on your yeah. Fourth July series. Yeah, that was right. my favorite. That was, that was awesome. Yeah. yeah, so it's an acquired taste. It's more iconic, in you know, yeah. I think it's impressive in the first one that Stallone wrote and directed it for his first thing. That's impressive. You know, to me, I would say number one and number five are probably my favorites. But anyway, back back on this, you got to play Bioshock. Here's the other reason why. So first of all. Um, you don't have to have played one and two 
for infinite and because infinite's kind of its own thing oh, okay um but one and two are so good like the story is awesome you the atmosphere is great so you got to play but they're turning them into shows as well they're also developing another bioshock game and supposedly the rumors is it's going to be in antarctica like like Ooh. a snowy place yeah so and that's important because if you know these games they it's their location and I don't want to give anything away for yeah. anybody. So um, definitely check check out Bioshock, Doug, because it's going to be really good. But they're also doing a Thor, not Thor, um, God of War. They're doing a God of War show. It worries me Ugh. because, geez, that's such a great, great game. The story is like a movie. And um, that worries me a little bit. The camera's kind of freaking out on me there. Man. I don't know why. There we go. Oh, there you go. The focus. Out of focus. All right. I think I'm moving too much. Freaking it out. So, all right. So that does it for the nerd news. Let's jump on into our main topic, which it's been beat to death in the media, but we're going to, we're going to give our own slant on it. You know, I almost thought it was a, uh, a tinfoil hat moment. Here we go. You know, all these uh, computers shutting down, airlines canceled, mass pandemic, uh, people running around everywhere. But then I yeah. look outside and I'm in the middle of a field. But whatever. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, in case you were living underneath a rock or if you're a teacher like my wife and you just don't pay attention to the news during the summer <laughs> because you have turned the world off, which is smart because it's a sanity check, right? Uh, there was a major issue, I think yesterday is upon this recording, in which there was airlines, food places, banking, they got hit with uh, things came to a screeching halt with a major Windows update. So let me break this down for you. What really happened? Right, there is a company that is called CrowdStrike. Now, I want to be fair. CrowdStrike makes really good software. Their job is to protect against cybersecurity incidents. They do that by very aggressively pushing updates, patches to computers like Windows computers. Um, it, a lot of it's very automated. It's a great product. It really is. What happened was they pushed out a patch that was bad. It was a patch from Microsoft that was faulty. Well, that caused what is lovingly known as the blue screen of death. I'm sure we've all of you ever <laughs> used a Windows computer at some point in your life. It's a blue screen with a generic error message. I used to have a t-shirt that had it on it because you'd see it so much back in the day. Um, but this happened. I had a friend of mine two friends of mine that with work that were traveling for vacation. And one said that, you know, his flight was got delayed. It grounded flights. He was sitting in the airport and all of the screens in the terminal just went blue screen, blue screen. He said it was very apoc apocalyptic feeling. Uh, another friend of mine sent me a picture of his daughter. They're, they're stuck at LAX and he, she's like Vanna White with all of these walls of screens with blue screens of death on them for windows. So I wanted to spell right away of what happened here. This was not, a tinfoil hat thing. This is not a cybersecurity. Hackers didn't get in to do this. This was, I know, as, as sad as that is. The thing is, this company, that's what they guard against. So I would dare say they're so good because they do keep things patched. If you keep something patched, you keep it safe because that reduces the amount of exploits and bugs that can be taken advantage of by a hacker to get into a system and cause mayhem. However, so who's to blame in all of this? First of all, CrowdStrike, shame on them. Good IT 101 is that you should always test your patches in a virtual environment before you do pushes. There's also something called a ring model. And that's a fancy way of saying that you just send your patches to early adopters. That's the outer part of the ring. We're talking like if you had a thousand people in your company, you would send it to only 25 of them. That's your outer ring. When they all give you a thumbs up, no problems. Then you push it to the next level of the ring. Okay, well, let's send it now to 100 users. They give a thumbs up. And you slowly get into the ring and you do these staged updates um, until they say it's good. And then you're at 1,000, right? That's how that works. That's a model developed by Microsoft, believe it or not. It's the ring model. They should have done that. They did, I don't believe they did that. And they also, for like the companies I work for, we do virtual computers. So you can stand up virtual computers. Think of virtual computers as like almost like you can stream a computer to you like Netflix, right? Uh, well, they could have stood up a bunch of virtual computers using software like what my company does. And you could have done testing to see if you got the blue screen. I don't think they did due diligence on their testing. So that's the bad thing CrowdStrike did. 
the bad thing Microsoft did, of course, but they've been known to do this because they're always doing updates. They pushed out a bad update. So between the bad update from Microsoft and then CrowdStrike, you know, not doing due diligence on their testing, it brought the world to a halt. There were people talking about they could Starbucks, people couldn't get their coffee, they couldn't do point of sales. It was it was very, very impactful. So there's my rant. There's the explainer. I did have, by the way, here's the blue screen. <laughs> one of the blue screens that you can see there. Um, this is on boot. Uh, one thing that kind of added a, a nuance to this, I will say, there's something called BitLocker that Microsoft has. What that does is it encrypts your local hard drive. And once this happened, it was very hard to recover. You had to basically physically go to every computer to unlock it uh, commonly in order to recover. So it takes a long time. If you have you know, thousands of computers and you got to touch every single one, well, there's a lot of IT workers this weekend working overtime. And it grounded flights. I saw this map of all the normal flights in the air and like how many of them stopped. However, there were some exceptions, Doug. I'm going to let you pick this one up. Not everybody was affected. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they all use this system because CrowdStrike gives such a great uh, protection to like those viruses and hackers and stuff. But to Southwest Airlines, uh, they are a little less uh, new, a little old school. Saving money, man. uh, (laughs) Yeah, saving money. I'm sure it costs a ton of money to roll out a brand new operating system does. to thousands and thousands of airports and computers. They are using Windows 3.1. And you're thinking 3.1, 95, uh, all those numbers, Windows uh, 7, yeah. they don't matter. So 3.1 came back way at, back in 1992, I think. Yep. No offense, Keith. I was like seven Shut years up. old. I don't hear it, man. I don't hear it. <laughs> so. I remember a world of text and DOS before Windows 3.1. And by the way, Windows 3.1 was kind of cool to play around with. It didn't really, as a kid playing video games, games did not run well on. I think Myst was the only thing I could really get to run on Windows 3.1. Outside, it was garbage. <laughs> Gaming on Windows didn't happen until like 95, Windows 95. So, sorry, keep going. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Windows 3.1, way back, 1992. You got to think that's before the iPhone, before <laughs> that's really a long time the... Ago. Big time internet and a lot of stuff. So hackers aren't worried about working on a Windows 3.1 system because you can't really get onto it. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, it, it's more about density of who's using it. Hackers okay. will go after the most popular operating system because they want to make the most damage. This is why Apple people kind of get snooty about, oh, we don't have these problems. It's it's not that Apple's less vulnerable or more. So it's, it's, it's more that believe it or not, there's more windows in the market space than there is. So their time, they want to make the biggest impact. So you're not going to focus on something that only has 10% of the market share. So it's more of that. Well, Windows 3.1 is so old, there's not a lot of market share. Now, I will say there are tons of exploits in Windows 3.1. So it could be taken advantage of. But you're right. You just don't have a large community of hackers developing for it. So on screen, I'm kind of switching gears real quick. Did the Las <laughs> Vegas they bubble? Did. It did. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for those uh, listening sphere. right now, we are looking at the Las Vegas sphere. If you don't know about it, it's this huge uh, dome-like structure that can put any kind of video, picture, images, and the blue screen of death <laughs> is on the Las Vegas sphere. That is I love amazing. it. I think it's awesome. That's so cool. So, yeah, this is a big deal where Delta, United Airlines, and flights were all grounded. Southwest was not affected because they're still running on Windows 3.1. Um, now, it says here that they also cited they, you know, the majority of portions, portions of Southwest systems are reportedly built on Windows 95 and Windows 3.1, which is something the company has actually come under fire for in the last several years. It could go without saying that Southwest needs to update its systems, but in case the agent operating system seems to be doing the airline some favors uh, to avoid a complete Y2 level K apocalypse. Uh, so they have come under fire saying they need to get it updated, but in this case, it kind of saved their butt. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm mixed on this because here's the thing I get it. They stay on it. It saved their butt now, but that doesn't mean running mission critical workloads on, on, on old versions of Windows is a good idea. So, uh, well, to counter I don't know. that, uh, mm-hmm. you'd be worried now because uh, all the news media has Southwest was saved on Windows uh, 3.1. So what's to say hackers 
They will. And say we are absolutely going to target if the they wanted to, of three point one. On if this is tr- yeah, if this is true, and it, especially if it's a state sponsored, you know, a lot of state sponsored hacking groups. Are we talking governments that have hacking groups? They just want to cause mayhem and see what they can do. If they decide they want to mess with one airline, they will, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have seen things. I can't share a lot of those things, but I have seen some crazy things, especially within the airline industry. Um, in, in what I do. So I'm not, a. this is awesome. It's a fun story, but, oh boy, Southwest call me. (laughs) One thing to add to that kind of, I watched this uh, documentary about our nuclear silos and you think these have got to be the most secure facilities, but I don't know what kind of system they're running. (laughs) Maybe windows 3.1, but to avoid other States, you know, we're kind of at feuds with Russia, China, other countries. Nuclear silos use uh, analog technology so they can't be hacked and other facets and stuff. So. Well, and that's the key thing. When it comes to nuclear reactors, and this is what people don't fully understand. When it comes to, and, and I have personal experience with this, I'll just say that. This isn't just my opinion. This is an informed opinion based on what I've done. So nuclear reactors, um, even nuclear weapon systems yes older technologies so what are those older technologies in some cases uh, windows 3.1 dos but even unix and if you're not familiar with unix unix was the precursor to linux and unix was what was ran it ran the mainframe systems if you don't know what a mainframe is you're pretty young uh and mainframe was a centralized computer in a server room there were no endpoint computers right there were there were no windows computers they were just terminals and everybody, and it was just a screen and a keyboard. That is it. It was all command line driven. Well, Unix was a very solid operating system. So a lot of, the, so there are older OSs. The most important thing when it comes to, that people don't understand about nuclear reactors, when it comes to these defense systems, they're air gapped. What that means is they are completely and unequivocally not connected to the public internet okay. or even to a network uh, at all. So that's what air gap means. It means a total physical disconnection. So the only way to infiltrate it is to break into and and jump jump on the computer, like and to do something. We're talking physical brute force kick down the door, but people like Doug uh, with AR-15s uh, that are very heavily trained ex-police or uh, military guard these facilities and you will not be making it to that computer. <laughs> That's what I will tell you. It's very secure. So a lot of people are like, oh my god, they're gonna they're gonna bring down all the nuclear people. No, the hackers aren't gonna do that. Now I will say our grid is probably more at risk because our grid somewhat has been modernized and there's some smart stuff and there are some risks there from hacking, but not the reactors themselves. Not the you know so I just want to put that at at, at bay. Well, and I think you're right. I'll kind of say that with our younger workforce, you know, we get younger and younger generations that are reliant on technology. You know, I hate to say it. Some of them don't know what a wrench looks like, unfortunately. But that being said, they're going to come into these industries, come into these businesses and think, why are we doing things such the old way? Hopefully they understand that security and that air gap. Hopefully they're not like, well, if we had brand new stuff, we could do a lot faster. Well, well that a you lot bring faster up a, is less secure. Dude, you bring up a great point. That is actually something I read this morning on LinkedIn in that a lot of people are saying on this CrowdStrike thing, how in the world did CrowdStrike not test the patch before pushing it out? What was interesting, they made the exact point that you did. They said that a lot of 30-somethings are running a lot of these companies. And they don't know a world like for us old people like me. Um, back in the day, we're talking, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. Windows NT, Windows 2000, those were that's what ran on servers. It seemed like every time Microsoft released a patch, it would blue screen. Back in the 90s, like we're talking bad early 2000s, it was terrible. In fact, there's a famous video of Bill Gates on stage showing Windows 98, maybe or Windows ME. It blue screened. While he's demoing it, he fired the dude, of course. Yeah. Uh, it was common. So what we learned, us old people, is that because we lived through a time where patches always broke stuff, in IT, it got ingrained into us because your business comes to a halt. You test your patches ahead of time. Okay, So 
these young people, as the operating systems have gotten more stable, gotten less and less, you don't, you rarely get a blue screen from a patch anymore nowadays. And that's a good thing. However, it's, it's caused them to become laxed. And they're like, ah, well, you know, maybe we don't need to go through all the rigorous testing because that takes a lot of time and that, and we need to stay safe. So there's actually, your point is a valid one in that there's a criticism about the generations not being aware of the risk. Uh, and you're right. What happens if they're like, you know what, let's go ahead and modernize. What, what's that going to hurt? Dude, right. so the point you made, I had just read this morning uh, on LinkedIn uh, on this guy doing an, an, an uh, like an analysis of what happened and what's going on and how safe are we and the fragility of how everything can come to a screeching halt in technology. And your point you just made is exactly what the dude said. So kudos to you. This is a fun, this is fun. Doug found this website, actually I've seen it. And it's uh, Windows through the years, versions one to 11. Now, I didn't mess with one much. So I'm going to go back just a second. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, you're great. Uh, it's uh, along the same thing. So, you know, we all know the Windows blue screen of death. Mm -hmm. I haven't been on a Mac in a long time. Do they have something planned? Is there a Mac blue yeah. screen of death? It's not a blue screen of death. It's the the rainbow wheel of death. So rainbow when Mac is death, thinking, okay. it's got this cool little beach ball. So it's a rainbow, but it's a beach ball circle. It spins. Spins. It actually just happened to me this week, believe it or not. Oh, I work no. on a Mac for work. And like I, I was I was crushing this operating system. Now to be fair, my my work Mac has it's an Intel based one. It's not one of the new M series. Dude, I had I had so much stuff open. I had a video editing thing. I was rendering something. I was on a Zoom call. I was doing high 4K like this thing sounded like it was gonna take off. Like this MacBook was like Rain. I've never heard this thing sound like I was stressing it out. And what happened? I got the little, the rainbow wheel of death. And I'm like, and I knew why I was crushing. And I thought to myself, I really want to get one of those M M3 Max. Maybe it would hit or processors. Uh, so like, maybe it would handle it better than this Intel. I was, I was destroying this thing. <laughs> it was nice. so funny. So yes, it's not really a blue screen, but it's the little rainbow. wheel. All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So this is a cool site, man. You found this, didn't you? Like this is. Yeah, so neat. I thought we're talking about uh, 3.1. I kind of know what it looks like, and yes, I've been on it. <sighs> Command so prompt, old. MS, I, DOS, I feel so old. all that. <laughs> but I, I had so to go old. back and see what 3.1 looks like, and I found a really great article from the folks down at CNET. Mm -hmm. It takes us from version 1.0 to all the way to our current version, Windows 11. That's right. And then some uh, terrible ones in the middle. <coughs> Vista, sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. So I didn't I didn't mess much with one, two. They, it really wasn't much. It wasn't very usable. Um, uh, Windows, <laughs> it's funny. Here's Windows 3.0. It looks so like. It looks Mac-ish Mac almost. Yes. Yeah, because oh, of, it's yeah. gray. Now, now, let's be fair, everybody. Mac was ahead of the game on a GUI, which is graf graphical user interface well before windows uh so and that's because mac you ever actually you're right now you're in the uh, steve jobs bio book aren't you like yeah it's he really stole interesting yeah if you uh yeah. listen to biographies autobiographies the so steve good. jobs book is amazing starting from childbirth all the way to developing all his programs yep and but uh, in racial relationship to this article he uh, has feuds with bill gates and yep. now in the book we're kind of in a semi partnership uh, love hate triangle with uh, bill gates and Steve yeah Jobs. they made up at it they needed each other at one point but what's interesting is around the time of windows 3.1 uh well actually a little bit before that early i would say late 80s uh, the reason why the macintosh happened and they had a gui interface before windows they stole the mouse from xerox park which is a research park they, they stole it from xerox they went there to go it was Steve Wozniak, it was Steve Jobs, and yep. and some engineers. And they were just, Xerox were like, they made photocopiers, man. But they did a research. We were trying things. And look, and they had this, it was a mouse. And they were asking all the questions. And they basically stole it from them. And um, that's what propelled the Macintosh to have a GUI interface before Windows. And then Windows, of course, caught on. And the big one's Windows 3.1 that you see here. This is the one that's saving Southwest uh, Airline, if you're listening to audio we're showing screenshots to show what the operating system looks like you, you know there's something about the good old days of the windows startup sounds shutdown sounds <laughs> it's just because uh, you heard them a lot you had to reboot nostalgia. it all the time I, I miss it yeah <laughs> windows 95 this was 
awesome. Now, what's funny, they paid the Rolling Stones like one point some odd million dollar, one point two five. I could look it up, but they paid the Rolling Stones for the song Start Me Up. And they played it on TV constantly because why? The start button is where Windows 95 uh, came. That's and that's why. Uh, so 95 is probably had tons of driver issues, but when it got good, it got good. There's versions. There's a version A and a version B. You always went in version B. And the reason why? USB. It supported USB. And that would just start and take off at the time. Uh, but there was always driver issues. But 95 is when you can really start to like actually game on the thing. Uh, then you get into Windows NT. Now, most people at home did not have Windows NT. That's because, well, that was for servers. Uh, NT stood for networking. Uh, and that was Windows NT was based off of 3.1. Windows 98, OG, great OS. Amazing OS. I have uh, spent so many hours on that. It, this is when it got good. Yeah. This is when it got good. Uh, and then Windows 2000, this was the equivalent of around the time of 98. This was a solid server OS, man. It, and I ran it a lot. It was, it was based off of, it had kernel similarities. And the kernel, by the way, is like the main, the main code brain. Think of it that way, uh, of 98. But it was stable. It was very, very good. It just got better and better. And then Windows ME. Oh, my God, it sucked. I That's wanted to like it. So I, never... I ran it for a while. But you talk about, I got so many blue screens, man. This thing sucked. This was one of the ones that may have actually blue screened on Bill Gates, if I remember. It's the Millennium Edition. Uh, it was terrible. Ugh, puke. And then I think, in my opinion, the crown jewel for so long, Windows XP. Mm -hmm. I mean, such a solid, solid Loved OS. Loved it. And it lasted forever. It was great OS. It was awesome. <laughs> you know, and people hate it on Vista. Fire. No, no, people hate it on Vista. I, I will say. I Vista, think it was resource heavy is why people it, were. Yes. It. So it was unoptimized. So it, it, it choked. Uh, it used a lot of RAM, but it wasn't a bad OS. I will, I will go on a limb and say, I think Windows ME was far worse than Vista. Oh, now, okay. at the yeah. tail end of Vista's life cycle, it was getting better. But then they totally, they, they, they switched to 7 pretty quick after Vista. 7 is on par with XP, in my opinion. 7 oh, okay. is awesome. It is it's solid. It's great. And then, we go and then you get another game. stinker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I skipped this one. This one was so bad. I think 8 was worse than Vista. I, yeah, I think 8 was almost the worst. So for those who don't know, 8 was a tile-based uh, program. Do you know why? Yeah, uh, they were trying to go mobile, right? They wanted one. So they were trying to compete with Apple, and they wanted one operating system for every device type. All across all devices. So yeah, uh, that does uh, Yeah. Matter. Now, be fair to them. That's a great idea. But even Apple themselves has Mac OS for the computers. They have the Pad OS for iPad. And then they even have separate OSs. They tried to make a universal operating system that would work on the Windows Phone, which was made by Nokia, which honestly, they were decent phones. Windows Phone. They also had a tablet version. And then it, I love their concept. It just it didn't scale down or up. And so it tanked. that's why they had the tiles, because they needed to fit the navigation on all different screen sizes. Great idea. Terrible execution. Terrible execution, yep. yeah. Uh, Windows 8.1 uh, just kept uh, getting worse. Hey, let's uh, try to improve it. But it's and and they didn't. Now, Windows 10, Rockstar. Love me some Windows 10. It's back to good. And people hate on 11, man. I love 11. I'm running it now. I'm a fan. I was an early adopter of 11. And people, what they had the problem with 11 was there's com something called a TPM chip, which is a, it's a cybersecurity chip on your motherboard. And Windows 11 excluded a lot of people because if you hadn't upgraded your hard drive or sorry, your hardware in a long time, like upgraded your computer, you can't do 11. People are like, oh, but to me, it's a safety thing. And, but it didn't pack me because I'm always, I'm always refreshing my stuff. So all my stuff had the chip. So I don't know. I didn't buy, I, I'm a fan of 11. I think it's great. Um. It just yeah, keep, and they do keep getting better. Flawlessly does everything I wanted to do. So. Now I will say I'm a little nervous about some of the copilot stuff, like with the whole thing of how it takes snapshots of what you're doing. I, I'm not a fan of that. I, I haven't upgraded that version yet. That's going to come in the fall. Once I play with, it, I'll let you guys know what it's like. So there's some things they're doing with it that have me a little hesitant. Um, and I'm an early adopter, man. I love new stuff. Like I, I'll be like the first for an OS, right? But um, there's some things they're doing with it. I'm a little like, mm, 
Mm. Now, Windows 11 did suffer from some performance issues because it was also resource heavy very early on. It's gotten better. It also had some driver issues, but all of these OSs almost stink right out the gate. And then you give it a few months to bake and then they get pretty solid. So there is your history lesson. Boy, we were like freaking all over the place on this episode. Very man. nice. I like it. So I think that does it. Now, you're traveling soon. I don't know if we're going to be able to have an episode next week uh, because yeah. Doug is jet setting, champagne popping. Hey, and you know what? I'm taking Southwest for uh, <laughs> the rest of the year. The whole time he's going to be sitting there thinking, Windows 3.1. I'm flying on Windows hey, 3.1. Yeah. <laughs> that was not uh, planned. I have no uh, involvement in CrowdStrike. My apologies. I was going to uh, say, what are you doing, man? Do, so. What are you doing? But uh, yeah, Southwest. So next week, let's take a look at the calendar. I want to make sure we have great shows for our fans. I appreciate everybody listening, but uh, we'll see. You know, we do get a little busy. We do get busy. We'll we'll see. We will strive to have something. But uh, if we don't, just know we will pick it up next. But maybe we'll surprise y'all. We'll, we'll talk about it out of band. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, that does it for this uh, this episode. We really appreciate you guys sticking with us. Uh, and don't forget, we have a merch store. Check that bad boy out. Uh, we are, you know, once things kind of simmer down a little bit, we're going to head into the fall. I'm going to try to line us up some some guests. I know it's been very heavy on the news and stuff, but there's been a lot going on and a lot to talk about. So, but it's been good. Other than that, Dougie, uh, what am I forgetting, man? Bring us home. Is that it? Uh, like I said, uh, we want to appreciate, or we do appreciate everybody listening. We want to thank you all for tuning in every week. We try to pick uh, current topics that maybe you haven't heard of, uh, that wired, uh, nerdy news that we just love and adore, uh, games, movies, all that good stuff. So Educate you. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to educate you. Don't listen to your, your local tinfoil hat-wearing person that thinks everything's a, uh, you know, a conspiracy theory. Come to right. us. We'll explain the technology to you. We'll tell you when you need to be worried about Skynet. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll tell you when it's Skynet. As opposed to your next door neighbor who thinks everything's Skynet or yeah. 5G is bleeding into their brains. It's hilarious. Every group, you know, whether it's D and D or not, needs that cautious uh, person. There is to a to warn you. Yeah, yeah. There is a there is a place for that. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying you got to balance. You got to balance. Oh, right, right. You got to got to be informed. In a in a world of misinformation, come here. We'll set you straight. We'll do our Absolutely. best. And if we're wrong. We'll admit it. So if the aliens come down and they admit, yeah, it's been us the whole time, Doug and I will come on the podcast and say, you know, we're wrong. It really was the Illuminati and the aliens doing their things. You know, if it's not <laughs> trademarked by X-Files, uh, Wired Nerdy, the truth is out there. We're oh, I'm pretty it. sure it's trademarked. I'm oh. pretty sure it's trademarked. Yeah. Well, all rights <laughs> reserved to X-Files. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, everybody, you have an awesome week, and we will catch you at the next episode. You take care. See ya.